Welcome. I'm Clint Churchill with, uh, and with me is Brian Barbata. We're the co-founders of the Practical Policy Institute of Hawaii, which is the new organization incorporated in January that we'll talk about uh, uh, during this webcast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, Jay Fidel and staff for uh, having us on. We appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to share our viewpoint and uh, uh, bring greater awareness to the climate change issue for the people of Hawaii. Uh, Brian and I thought we would uh, share the co-hosting, so we'll pass it back and forth uh, four or five times, and uh, and rather than uh, one host and one uh, person talking uh, the entire time. So I thought I would start. Uh, folks probably don't know uh, much about either one of us. Uh, start with my background. 52-year uh, resident of Hawaii. My main career was with the Campbell Estate, Chief Operating Officer, and then CEO, and then a trustee for about. Uh, uh, the next 15 years. Uh, overlapping uh, career as a director with Bank of Hawaii, where I chaired the Audit and Risk Committee for 14 years, and earlier overlapping career as a pilot in the Hawaii Air National Guard, and my final position was, was commander of, of the uh, Hawaii Air Guard. So that's a, a thumbnail uh, on myself. Uh, Brian, how about your background? Yeah, my background uh, in Hawaii goes back to the mid 70s when I arrived here and um, I've worked in a number of uh, <clears throat> positions here since then, but I think most relevant to this uh, are, is my long entrepreneurial history. I've been in, I think, something like 15 small businesses ranging from petroleum distribution to coffee farming to bottled water. We did uh, solar panel installations, uh, construction. So I've been in a great variety of things. Um, prior to coming out here, I uh, went to Harvard Business School, was a Navy SEAL, and originally lived in San Francisco. So that's uh, pretty much the brief on mine. Well, my interest in uh, climate change uh, got started years ago when I would start uh, kind of collecting uh, in clip articles in the paper and magazines. Uh, and then that kind of accelerated about two and a half years ago. Uh, there was an article in the Star Advertiser by Professor Richard Brill. I'll hold it up for just <clears throat> just a second. And uh, in that article, he talked about the the main uh, nature's greenhouse gas, which is water vapor. I knew very little about that, and I had a hunch that uh, others uh, didn't either. Uh, but in that article, Professor Brill mentioned that uh, in the models that uh, uh, climate scientists are doing, they, they relegate water vapor to a lesser factor in, in projecting out the impact of, uh, of climate change. In fact, he used the words unintentionally misleading. So for a guy like me with a lot of audit committee background, that, that uh, kind of inspired me to dig deeper, uh, which I've done and collected lots of articles and learned uh, a lot more about, uh, about water vapor and, uh, and climate change uh, in general. Uh, a lot of climate change uh, uh, articles, op-eds, come from organizations with a vested interest. Uh, we're pretty proud of our uh, little institute. There's only a half a dozen of us on the board that um, uh, we have no vested interest. We have no uh, payroll from anybody with an interest in the, in the matter. Uh, four of the six of us are retirees with time to, to learn. Um, and what I've uh, realized is that uh, misinformation or omission of information often leads to what I'll call subtle perception of the truth. And uh, that happened as recently, and, and the final straw for me was a, was a op-ed piece as recently as January of this year. And uh, I'll read you the, uh, the quote from a, a, probably a very uh, informed individual uh, to give you an indication of the, the misleading information that keeps getting repeated. And he said, climate change is largely caused by greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere by burning of fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas. Uh, those statements are both wrong. Uh, they both, uh, again, relegate nature's uh, uh, greenhouse gas to practically a minor, minor, minor role. So uh, 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 we think there's a big need for education, and that's one of the uh, 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 four aspects of our uh, uh, institute that we hope to educate uh, the public on. So uh, 
Brian, I know you studied uh, a lot about the uh, 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 climate change issue and Hawaii's policies. Uh, do you have any uh, any thoughts you'd like to, to share? Well, I, I got started uh, in this whole thing mainly because like all of us, uh, you know, I was enamored with the beauty of Hawaii, the landscape of Hawaii, the, our uniqueness here. And I'm one of these guys who's, you know, been in, who's in the ocean all the time and has taken advantage of everything that Hawaii has to offer. So when I saw the first windmills go up, which I believe was on Maui, I kind of was very surprised that that would happen in Hawaii. You know, we have a background with the, the outdoor circle, not allowing billboards and a lot of other things that keep our visual landscape clean. And I was a little bit surprised uh, on that Maui experience to find that uh, a lot of people thought it was uh, pretty neat that we were, you know, finding renewable sources of electricity. And I kind of couldn't believe that, but it was a big deal for me. I originally from California and I go way back there, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember the Altamont Pass and anybody can go look that up on Google and see what a visual disaster that is and was. There's nothing out there. It's just thousands and thousands of windmills, a lot of them decrepit and falling apart. And, and uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that I think wakes people up to, uh, to windmills. And then I was very, very happy recently, a couple of years ago, I guess it is now, to see the people of Kahuku sort of rise up and other people rise up in a sort of a not in my backyard response to, <clears throat> to windmills. So um, that really began my interest in the whole subject of climate change. Uh, is it going to be windmills? Is it going to be solar? What's it going to be? And I started looking into some of these things. And, um, you know, that's when Clinton and I got together and we both had similar general interests and very specific interests of our own and uh, decided to uh, start this institute. Um, I, would, I would add again, I, I think Clinton may have already mentioned it, that um, you know, we don't want to be cast as climate deniers. We're, we're absolutely committed to the idea that there is such a thing as climate change. Uh, the Institute is for Hawaii. It's kind of about what is Hawaii's role in this thing and what do the policies that the legislature uh, is pursuing mean for Hawaii. One of the things that we think is missing is people kind of looking at the other side of things. There are always trade-offs in everything we do. And there are trade-offs in responses to climate change. So those are some of the things we're looking at. And that was pretty much the way I, I got into it. And um, if you could bring up uh, the slide, please, about our purpose, I think that probably says it all. Uh, those are the four elements of, uh, of, of our mission. Uh, you can read them on the screen. I won't read them back to you. But uh, <clears throat> you know we're, we are committed to, to investigating things that are unique to Hawaii. We're not really interested in the global issues, the country issues. We're interested in, in responding to Hawaii. So that's, uh, that's why I'm in it. Um, and uh, Clint, what, uh, what, other, what are your other thoughts about uh, uh, the climate system? Well, well, Brian, I totally agree with you. Uh, climate change is happening. It's obvious to all of us. Uh, and I agree with you that we're not deniers. But the real question, is um, uh, what, how much of climate change is already there caused by nature versus caused by man. Uh, climate change happened well before the Industrial Revolution, well before we burned the first uh, uh, gallon of gas or, 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 natural, or burned any natural gas. Uh, but what I found, uh, as I mentioned before, is that people just don't understand um, the, basics, uh, the basic science of, of climate change. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I gave a talk to a, a lunch group, a civic group, well-educated, and I made sure there's a piece of paper and a pencil for everybody in attendance. There were about uh, 30 there. So I asked them the question, please put down uh, the number one greenhouse gas. So I gave them some time to respond. And then I asked uh, how many put uh, CO2? Uh, a little bit less than half. Um, and then I asked uh, how many put methane? And that was pretty much the rest of them. And I said, well, how many of you put water vapor? Not a single one. So uh, that kind of confirmed what I had uh, learned anecdotally talking to various groups after tennis or after golf, that nobody understands the role of water vapor. 
It's humidity. We know it as a relative humidity, but it's a significant percentage of, of the atmosphere. Uh, on a 85 degree day, 70% humidity in Honolulu, 2% uh, of the atmosphere. So you have that on the one hand, uh, and so let's look on at CO2 on the other hand. Uh, the second question I asked is, please put down the percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere. And after some time, I asked for responses, how many 5%, quite a few hands went up, how much more than 1%, uh, almost all of the rest, how much less than 1%, uh, a few hands. And I asked how much, how many of you feel that CO2 comprises less than one-tenth of 1%? Again, not a single hand went up. Uh, the measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, that everybody seems to accept has been done over at Mauna Loa on the Big Island for the last 64 years. In the recent measurements, about 415 parts per million. Most press releases on this relate it to 4,000 years ago. But uh, I would uh, relate it, though, to what percentage of the atmosphere. 415 parts per million is less than four one-hundredths of one percent and two-thirds of that was in existence before the before uh, the industrial revolution so we're only talking about a growth of 130 parts per million being co2 so you have these huge differences there's lots more to it that we hope to cover in a future show about uh, uh how the earth uh, how the atmosphere heats up uh the infrared spectrum and so forth but not enough time to get into that here but the point is as i mentioned earlier there's a huge need for education in this whole arena. Uh, Brian, back to you. Uh, I know we've, we've set that 100% renewable energy goal uh, by, by 2045 for our state. And you've done a, uh, learned a lot about the, the uh, concerns and elements uh, of that goal. Yeah, um, again, uh, you know, the visual blight was the first thing that drove me. And so one of the things I wanted to look at is uh, uh, what are the scenarios where we might end up in 2045? I think if people look at the um, at the uh, uh, energy office uh, report, they do one at the end of each year. There's a new one out right now. And you look at other documents, it can be a little confusing because every island reports different renewables. Some of them are very significant on other islands like Kauai, a lot of hydro, a lot of biomass, various things on other islands. But when you boil it down, the one that needs to get the most attention is Oahu. And I don't mean that to diminish the neighbor islands at all, but the fact of the matter is that this is where most of the people are and where most of the electricity is produced. So I started looking at, 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 at the whole subject in terms of, uh, of Oahu, and um, particularly with respect to the future of the mix of wind and solar. Um, I, I would say parenthetically that anyone who's talking about some of these other options like like biomass and solar and and uh, uh, geothermal for example on Oahu it's just sort of irrelevant that is not those are not going to be big players on the island of Oahu like they might be in other places so it comes down to solar and wind and um, it's a very difficult thing to try to estimate what that mix might be in the future but I think we're at a point now where there are a lot of doubts being cast about wind, and I feel good about that. Uh, Senator Rivera from the North Shore uh, is a friend of ours, and we've talked to him a bit about wind. Of course, he's he's very against it being uh, being uh, pushed in rural areas like like his North Shore, and I think that sentiment probably is shared by a lot of people, but they just haven't seen it yet. So visualization of these things is a bit of a problem. It's the same thing with solar. And I believe that what this all boils down to is wind probably is pretty much not going anywhere, but solar is, and solar will be proliferated all over in order to get to these 2045 goals. We're not very far there as, as we stand right now. So when you go out and you see some of the utility solar farms and the rooftop solar uh, around, and it's, it's not particularly noticeable, so it doesn't seem like a big deal. But the, the, uh, the installed capacity of solar at the end of 2020, I don't have it right here for 21 yet, uh, was only about 16% of the current demand. Current demand is about 10 gigawatts. It's a huge number, and I'm not going to bore all you people with uh, gigawatts and megawatts and megawatt hours and gigawatt hours. It can get a little mind-boggling. I've had to wade through it myself. 
But um, right now, solar is not much. When you start looking at how big it would really have to get by 2045 for us to have 100% renewable uh, supply from solar, it's literally millions and millions of panels. Um, we have one, uh, one farm right now, Kalailoa, 500,000 panels in Kalailoa produces 49 megawatt hours or 49 megawatts of capacity. So, you know, it's a huge subject. And, uh, and one of these days, the Institute hopes to develop uh, some visuals on this so people can see just what the visual scenarios um, might look like. The other thing about solar, wind, and some of the others, but particularly solar and wind, is they are intermittent suppliers of electricity. When the wind blows, they generate electricity. When the sun shines, they generate electricity. That doesn't happen all the time, so they're intermittent. And Hawaiian Electric has struggled with that for quite a while now because to have intermittent power doesn't really displace the fossil fuel power that we're all looking to displace. So how do you fix that? Well, in the last few years, the white knight of batteries has come running in to save the day. And now that's how we're converting intermittent power to um, what they call firm power. That's a very important concept. And uh, we're, we're going to be looking very hard at battery capacity, uh, how much backup we really have in battery capacity, whether for the people of Hawaii, it replicates uh, the capabilities of a fossil fuel power plant. Uh, it can, but it takes a lot of batteries, and it's a bigger subject than anybody's really uh, focused on for now. So, um, and I think the, the other thing about 100% renewables that people have to remember is that by 2045, the state is expecting to have all the cars converted to electric vehicles. That's a huge load on the requirements uh, for electricity, as is uh, the rail, art. Both of those things uh, have to be accounted for in the 2045 demand. The 2022 demand is 10, 10, 10, what did I say? 10 gigawatt hours. I get confused myself. Uh, and the 2045 demand is going to be probably 30, 40, maybe 50% more than that based on these things. So the whole issue of electric vehicles and electric vehicle chargers is all wrapped up in this 100% uh, 2045 renewable economy, which in closing, I'll say is pretty much arbitrary. 100% is a nice round number, but I don't think anybody's ever done any real science on why it should be 100%. I don't know that we're going to really investigate that. We'll take it at face value, but we are going to try to analyze what that means to the people of Hawaii in terms of the development of these sources. So Clint, uh, you know, one of the things that I've just touched on, and uh, I know you're an expert in uh, is land use. What, what, where are we going with uh, land use and renewables? I'll comment on that, but I'd like to add one, uh, one thought, Brian, to your uh, mentioning batteries. Uh, there's currently the first uh, major industrial battery project under construction out at, uh, out at Kapolei. Uh, it will provide, uh, uh, once it's fully charged in, in one day, uh, 565 megawatts of, uh, of, of power. Uh, so to relate that to a typical day's usage uh, on Oahu, that's about two and a half percent. That uh, facility cost some two hundred million dollars. So picture the cloudy days like we had uh, December December fifth, sixth, January second, third, where we have to draw down those batteries. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, that a two hundred million dollar plant won't even last us till ten o'clock in the morning. So is it going to take 20 more of those battery installations uh, and $4 billion of investment that'll have to be paid back by the rate payers. So we've had a lot of discussion around, uh, around that issue. So sorry for adding on there, Ryan, but uh, uh, yeah, let's talk about land use. Uh, the current uh, land use by Hawaiian Metric is minimal. The Kahi power plant, Waiau power plant, some uh, uh, fuel storage at Campbell Industrial Park, uh, very low. But if we're gonna add something like 800 megawatts of capacity uh, of solar industrial farms, and it's something like five acres per, uh, per megawatt, that's going to require as much as 4,000 acres. That's a huge amount of land. And as Brian mentioned, the conversion to electric vehicles, perhaps another uh, 600 megawatts of capacity, another 3,000 acres, 
So the point of this, and these are uh, uh, just round numbers to make the point, is that they're going to run into competing policies. We all know that the cost of housing in Hawaii is the highest or right next to the highest in the nation. Are we going to take all of this land out of possible circulation for residential development? Are we going to take all of this land out of agricultural use? Uh, uh, we have a lot of goals to become closer to uh, self-sufficiency. So clearly we need a lot of further analysis on the land use trade-offs of setting this uh, glorious sounding 100% goal, but there's a lot of implications to it and a lot of considerations that need, uh, need a lot further discussion. Uh, Ryan, uh, next item on our uh, list of uh, uh, topic to discuss uh, is adapting. Uh, back over to you. Yeah, one of the things I think uh, people need to think about is that this is a very long-term proposition uh, we're not going to fall off the end of the earth in 2040, 2050, 2060. It's, it is insidious and it's a very long-term proposition, which we will be able to solve incrementally. And adaptation is one of those incremental solutions. Uh, a lot of places in the world are thinking about that right now. <clears throat> there have been some, some ap apocalyptic scenarios of flooding and weather uh, changes, climate, uh, extreme weather changes. Uh, they may all come to pass. They're going to come to pass and we will watch them and we will need to have strategies for making sure they don't become too disruptive or damaging to life and property. Um, but I, I think for people to think that we have to do things today, that, 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 that there's, this, uh, there's this paranoia of uh, the end of the world is coming is a little misplaced. For one thing, when you look at forecasts of anything to do with climate change, whether it's temperature, sea level rise, weather, whatever, you always, in 100% of the cases, you find a range, a range of outcomes. And some of them can be very dramatic. Uh, in the case of sea level rise, we've got one chart that shows a, a range of 10 inches to 20 feet. That's a kind of a crazy range. And you have to ask yourself, so where in there are the probabilities? You know, what's the likely scenario? What are the downsides of, you know, picking one versus the other? And if you're somebody who wants to be uh, paranoid about it, you'll pick 20 feet and scream that the sky is falling. We don't think it's going to be like that. We think there more time is needed to record more data. I think a lot of people agree with that. Um, it's very interesting that a lot of these charts start from today at basically zero. They, all the lines are together today. And all of a sudden they rapidly diverge over the next 30, 40 years. You know, that's all forecasting and it's a very complicated science. Climate science, there may be a lot of experts that agree on a lot of things, but they don't all agree on the same things. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, how much do we want to respond to these kinds of forecasts? Which ones do we want to respond to? And how much time can we take to kind of make sure that we're right before we do things that are damaging to our basic uh, lifestyles and environment? Um, and I think one of the one of the things that is a, a bit risky with this, and I'll just close with this. I'm I I, I did have a, a company that distributed fuel products. We're just a trucking company that buys from the big refinery and then sends it off to other people. But I know a little bit about about petroleum business and distribution, and I know a little bit about the refining business. I think this effort to in some cases actually make fossil fuels illegal and to risk shutting down the refinery without a proper assessment of its strategic importance are a little misguided. We need to realize that fossil fuels are going to be here for a long time. That's a whole other subject we'll get into someday. I think you'll find it very interesting if you tune back in, but the refinery and fossil fuels are not just going to disappear. They are huge. They are part of modern life. We really cannot live without them. It's not just gasoline and jet fuel. It's everything. As you turn yourself 360 degrees, wherever you are watching this, you will not be able to find one thing in your view that is not heavily dependent on the production of fossil fuels and use of fossil fuels. So I'll end with that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again next time and uh, uh, probably devote a whole program to, uh, to that transition. So Clint, uh, we don't have a lot more time. We've got some closing thoughts. Uh, certainly, uh, hopefully we've conveyed what the Practical Policy Institute of Hawaii is about. Uh, we're brand new, but we intend to make our presence uh, 
known through a website. Uh, we're so new, don't even have that yet. Quote, under construction, as you've seen. Uh, we'll be testifying and have been at the legislature and tend to do so at the city council. We've had a couple of op-eds. Uh, we hope to do more webinars like this, position papers to our uh, uh, community leaders, social media, continue the presentations to uh, lunch groups, clubs, associations, and so forth. Uh, a primary goal is education of the public. But equally important, perhaps even more so, is, is that uh, our policymakers, the legislature and the city and county of Honolulu, uh, need to make fully informed decisions. There's a lot they can do, uh, policies, taxation, establishing priorities, uh, incentives, uh, subsidies, and so forth. Uh, and yes, we intend to uh, uh, call some of the, uh, what we think is exaggerated projections uh, that are included in model. Uh, we think critical informed judgment and scientific methodological fact checking is important. Uh, There's an interesting letter to the editor uh, not too long ago that if you start with the assumption that the more deviant the facts, the more improbable the projections, it's always a good place to begin the hunt for veracity. So that's what we intend to do. Um, uh, in the words of uh, uh, Representative Chris Lee, uh, that was in the Scientific American uh, not too long ago, uh, uh, he said that the 100% renewable goal in 2045 was set, and this is the exact quote, without doing the due diligence to figure out how this will be achieved. Uh, we think there's a lot more work to, uh, a lot more due diligence that needs to be done. And uh, uh, we think it's under time, it's time to undertake uh, that due diligence. So again, thank you to uh, Jay Fidel and the uh, Think Tech Hawaii team for having us. Uh, we hope to be a regular uh, voice on this uh, webcast or at least uh, participate frequency, frequently. Uh, I think that's our, uh, uh, time limit. Uh, uh, thank you again for, uh, for tuning in and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.